welcome to each one of you and especially to those worshiping with us for the very first time. We're so glad to be worshiping the Lord together with you. And it's Christmas season, so we will sing songs that have to do with the birth of Jesus. Even though this is the last in the Esther series, we want to be able to worship the Lord through singing Christmas songs. I'll ask Rahel to read a scripture portion for us this morning. And there were shepherds out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great host of heavenly angels appeared before them singing, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men on whom his favor rests. This is taken from Luke 2, verses 8 to 14. That was a surprise to me that she had memorized the whole thing. Well, she memorized it when she was a kid and still remembered it till today. The song that we're going to sing now is, While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground. Can you imagine just sitting there doing your work and suddenly a host of angels come? So let's sing this song. While shepherds watch their flocks by This next song is a very familiar carol and one among the many of our favorites. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Rest the 
Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Would you read the scripture along with us, please? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no other name other than the name of Jesus. Would you look to the Lord in prayer with me? Jesus, name above all names, name which is higher than any other name, the name at which every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Emmanuel, God with us, joy to the world, the Lord has come. We are so grateful to you, O God, for sending Jesus to earth to be born and to die for our sins, O oh God, and to rise again so that we can have hope eternal. How great you are. We are so grateful to you, O oh God. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. We thank you for the reminder this Christmas season of your great love for us, O oh God. Father, this morning there may be many here who are coming with heavy hearts. Lord, with many, many different troubles and even situations around the world are so discouraging but we thank you that in a changing world you are unchanging God and so we pray Heavenly Father this morning whatever our problems may be we would be able to leave it at the foot of your cross Lord God and that you would speak to each one of us today and we pray that you would anoint your servant afresh this morning as you speak through him we ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts to understand and hear what you want to say to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm hoping that just like me, uh, many of you have truly enjoyed our study of the book of Esther. I want to make one request. Now, this is an earnest request. And I'm really hoping for a response from each one of you. Many of you who worship online, we know personally 
there are several of you that we have never heard from and we don't even know. So here's what we are doing this morning. I'm putting my number. It's my WhatsApp number. It's my contact number. You can SMS on this number. I'm putting my number on the screen. You can call us and we would be happy to pray with you. Here's the request I want to make this morning. In our study of the book of Esther, this is the 12th sermon. I want you to think about that one lesson that really impacted your life. One lesson that you picked up from the book of Esther that you would not forget for the rest of your life. And would you please send it to us? And I want to tell you this morning that when you do that, it encourages us greatly. So do take the time at the end of our service this morning before you rush off into the arrangements for lunch and have a wonderful time of lunch together as a family. Would you just take a couple of moments to send us a text and say, hey, this is something that God really challenged me from the book of Esther. And I want to thank God for his word. Once again, let's open our Bible to the book of Esther. Like I said to you today, we are going to bring this book to a grand conclusion. We're going to look at an extended passage of scripture, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. And as you turn with me in your Bible to the book of Esther this morning, very quickly, let's review the outline to the book of Esther. That's right, the book of Esther has... 10 chapters. We divided the book of Esther into four sections. Section number one, chapter one and two, we looked at the crowning of Esther, the dethroning of Vashti and the enthroning of Esther. Chapter three, four and five is the conspiracy of evil Haman. Chapter 6 and 7 is the condemnation of evil Haman. And chapter 8, 9 and 10 is the celebration, the celebration of God's people, the Jews. Today, we're going to look at chapter 7, 8, 9 and 10. Now, it's an extended passage of scripture and it will be difficult for us to read this passage of scripture this morning. So let me request you in this week, maybe it's, it's best if you can do it today, spend some time to try and read chapter 7, 8, 9 and 10. Now, as we look at these chapters, what are some lessons we can take away? I want to place before you five lessons really quickly this morning. Lesson number one, as I look at chapter seven, I see chapter seven as a time of reckoning. This is a time of reckoning for evil Haman. He has plotted, he has worked against the people of God, and he thinks that he will triumph. He is confident, but the Bible reminds us that God is sovereign, he is on the throne, and what we sow, we will reap. So chapter 7 is a lesson on reckoning. Chapter 8 is a lesson on reversing. Though Haman was hanged on the gallows, as you come into chapter 8, you realize that Esther and Mordecai and the people of, of God are faced with a very unique challenge. The edict of Xerxes can't be reversed. Now, in chapter 8, God reverses the irreversible. So chapter 7 is a lesson on reckoning. Chapter 8 is a lesson on reversing chapter 9 we learn two lessons from chapter 9 chapter 9 verses 1 to 16 is the lesson of rescuing a god who rescues his people all the jews were certain that they were going to be slaughtered but what god does is that he turns the tables around and then chapter 9 verses 17 to 32 is a lesson on rejoicing the household of israel will rejoice Rejoice in what God has done. And chapter 10 is a lesson on recognizing 
Oh Mordecai, his faithfulness is recognized by God and recognized by men. Very quickly this morning, five lessons. Number one is the lesson on reckoning. Number two is the lesson on reversing. Number three is the lesson on rescuing. Number four is the lesson on rejoicing. And number five is the lesson on recognizing. Like I said, in so many ways, I'm just going to sweep through these passages this morning. And my prayer is that God would speak to us in deep and personal ways. As you turn to chapter 7, this is the lesson of reckoning. I've divided chapter 7 into three parts. As I look at verses 1 to 4, I see Esther's request. If you look with me at your Bible, the Bible says, so king, the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine for a second time, the king asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then the Bible says, then Queen Esther answered. And as you read verses 3 and 4, you have the request of Queen Esther. Now, as I read those couple of verses, I put down three words in my notes, which I'd like you to put down in yours. Number one, I see a readiness. In the way in which Esther speaks to Xerxes, you see a readiness. Esther has prepared herself. Esther has in so many ways rehearsed what she's going to say to Xerxes. Esther has thought through clearly what she's going to say to Xerxes. So as you're looking at Esther's request, please keep in mind that Esther comes as a woman of readiness. Now that's an important lesson for us to learn, that in all the works we do, in the places that God has placed us, may we always be a people of readiness. May we not be a people who, you know, in the last minute try to pull things together and pull it off. May we not be a people who in many ways, you know, just take it casually. Esther was ready when it came to making her request. The second word I put down is that Esther was respectful. As she speaks to Xerxes, she speaks with great respectfulness. If I have found favor in your sight, you don't need to answer me, but I will be very grateful if you do. So as you read those verses, you see Esther's readiness. You also see Esther's respectfulness. And one of the things that I don't want you to miss is that Esther is willing to take a great risk to honor God. Because when she makes this request, Esther does not know how Xerxes will respond. Esther does not know if Xerxes is going to be shocked saying, I didn't know you were a Jewess. You have cheated me. You be thrown to the gallows. She does not know what is going to happen. But Esther is willing to take that risk to bring God the honor and the praise. So as you're looking at Esther chapter 7 verses 1 to 4, you see Esther's request. There is a readiness. There is a respectfulness and there is a willing to take a risk to bring the heart of God honor and praise. Then you have verses 5 down to verse 8, Xerxes' rage. The Bible says, King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? Look with me at verse 7. And the king got up in a rage. He left his wine and he walked out of that particular room. So you see, as you're looking at verses uh, 5 down to verse 8, you see all oh, the rage, the rage of Xerxes. Now, as I look at that particular passage of scripture, I put down two words in my notes. Number one is the word apathy. You know, when Esther brings this request before the king, Xerxes, he turns around and says, who is it? Where is this guy who's done this? And Haman has all the while been sitting right in his court. Isn't it sad? Stop and think about something this morning. Here is Mordecai, the faithful, honest, truthful, integrous man. Where is he? He is at the gate of the court. And here is Haman, corrupt vile, horrible, miserable man. Where is he? He is in the court. You see the kind of choices that Xerxes was making? He was leaving the faithful out and he was keeping those people who were actually detrimental to him, close to him. So in some ways, as I look at the response 
As I look at the rage of Xerxes, the first note that I put down in my notes is the apathy of Xerxes. He does not have a clue that right within his court is a man that is plotting against Queen Esther and the household of God's people. The second word that I put down is not just his apathy, but his anger. As you look at these verses, the Bible says, now he was in a fit of rage. When he walked out from that room, he'd already determined what was going to happen to Haman. And Haman knew fully well what the king had determined. And that's why Haman was falling down at the feet of Esther and pleading with Esther saying, please, please, would you be able to save me? The king got up in rage and left his wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. So as you're looking at chapter 7, you're seeing Esther's request, you're seeing Xerxes' rage, and finally, you're seeing Haman uh, is the one who reaps. So Esther's request, Xerxes' rage, Haman reaps. What does Haman reap? Now, let me read this particular section for you uh, at this particular time. I want to read to you verses 9 and 10, but I'd like you to also keep in mind what has just happened in the previous verse. Let me read verse 7, 9 and 10. In verse 7, the Bible says, The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Look with me at verse 9. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending to the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Now, I don't know, as I read those verses, if you notice three very um, humorous things that are happening. One, when you look at this book, Esther, when you look at chapter 3 and verse 5, you realize that part of the major problem in this particular book is Haman was angry because Mordecai, who was a Jew, would not bow down to him. Chapter 3, verse 5, Haman was filled with rage. Why? Because Mordecai did not bow down to him. Now you read chapter 7 and verse 7. What do you see? You see Haman bowing down to a Jewess. Isn't it amazing? You know, here is a man who is angry that a Jew is not bowing down to him. A, a Jewish male is not bowing down to him. Now, he is bowing down before Queen Esther and pleading for his life. The Bible reminds us that what we sow, we will also reap. The second um, um, thing that I find really important for us to keep in mind, again, when you read chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, when, when Mordecai is not bowing to Haman, what is happening is all of the court officials are watching this and they are speaking repeatedly to Mordecai saying, aren't you going to bow down to Haman? And Mordecai says, no, I'm not going to bow down to Haman. And so what do they do? They complain against Mordecai to him. And now that's in chapter 3. Here, the moment the king speaks those words, the Bible says almost immediately Harbona speaks up. And what is Harbona saying? He says, you know what? There's a gallows 50 cubits high that this man has set up for Mordecai. Maybe he needs to be thrown onto that gallows. You see, as you're looking at chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, because of his power, Haman had all the people in the kingdom bowing to him and supporting him. But now when you come down to chapter 7 and you read verse 9, you realize that the people have turned against Haman and they are the first ones to report to Xerxes the evil that Haman has been doing in the kingdom. And the third um, and the most obvious lesson is that as you look at the Bible, as you look at chapter 5 and verse 14, you see that Haman, at the advice of Zeresh's wife and his, and his counselors, set up this huge gallows and he was going to impale Mordecai on it. And yet as you look at chapter 7 verses 9 to 10, it's the same gallows on which Haman will be impaled. Isn't it amazing that the Bible reminds us, don't be foolish. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. Here is a man angry because Mordecai would not bow down to him. Now he is bowing down 
to a Jewess. Here is a man, all of the people around were supporting him because of his power. Now, all of those people have turned against him at this moment. What you saw, you will reap. Here is a man who set up this 50 cubit, um, you know, gallows to impale Mordecai. Now, he is impaled on it himself. You see, what you sow, you will reap. The Bible reminds us that what we sow, we will reap. Amazing lessons, isn't it? In chapter 7, a time of reckoning. Esther's request, Xerxes' rage, and Haman reaps. Now move with me to chapter 8. As you move down to chapter 8, we're looking at the lesson of reversing. And as I look at chapter 8, again, I put down three words in my notes for chapter 8. What are those three words? Number one, as I look at verses 1 and 2, and also verse 15, I see the promotion. The promotion of whom? The promotion of Mordecai. As you read verses 1 and 2, you realize that Mordecai is now blessed with possessions. Please keep, uh, please stop and think about it. As Mordecai struggles, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, as he's struggling, he's sitting at the gate. Here is an honest man. Here is a man of integrity. Here is a man who's trying his best to please God and also be faithful in the place that God has placed him. And yet here is a man who's struggling. Here is a man who has not been honored. Here is a man who's been left out. But as you come down to chapter 8, you see the promotion of Xerxes and you see two very clear things that are happening. One is God blesses Xerxes with possessions. Everything that was Haman's has now been given over to Mordecai. Mordecai gets the entire inheritance of Haman. And please keep in your mind, you remember that chapter, chapter 5, when Haman comes back and he's also thrilled that Esther has invited him to the banquet and he's boasting with his family. He says, you know what, I've got so much possession. Look at the position I have. Look at the people I have. Look at the riches I have. Now, all of those riches have been given to Mordecai. Isn't it amazing? Amazing, the promotion of Mordecai. He is blessed with possessions. And secondly, he is blessed with a unique position. If you look at verse 2, the Bible says, The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and he presented it to Mordecai. And Mordecai, in so many ways, becomes number two in charge over the kingdom of Xerxes. So as you're looking at chapter 8, one of the lessons that you take away is the promotion of Mordecai. And I want to just encourage you. Some of us are, you know, being faithful, working really hard and are struggling because there are others who seemingly are getting promoted and we are just stagnating where we are. Please keep in mind that God watches and in his, and in, and in his appointment, he is a God who will exalt us. Humble yourself before the Lord and in due season, he will lift you up. Then as I look at verses 3 to 8, I see the petition of Esther. I see that Esther makes a request. As you read this particular section, it's divided into two parts, right? Esther makes a request. She comes to Xerxes and she says, Xerxes, I have a request. And what is that request? Can we write a new edict so that the household of the Jews will not be slaughtered? You have the request of Esther and then you have the reply of Xerxes. And Xerxes says, you know what? You can do what you want, but please keep in mind that an edict that has been signed in C by Xerxes cannot be repealed. So here is, in some ways, the request of Esther and the reply of Xerxes. And the reply of Xerxes must have, in some ways, taken the household of God by surprise. What do we do? Though Haman has died, and one of the things that I want to just say to you in passing this morning, isn't it sad that some of the things that evil people do, much after they have even died, they continue to have their own repercussions and hurts in the lives of people. Isn't it sad that sometimes evil people, they do evil and then they die the most miserable deaths. But even after their death, what they've done continues to hurt people. And in some ways, Haman had made this edict signed and sealed by the seal of Xerxes. And now it was something that could not be repealed. And in some ways, you say to yourself, God, is there a way out? Is there a way out? There is nothing that can be reversed in this situation. And God reminds us, I am the God of grand reversals. When you think there is no way out, I will make a way out. And this morning, I just want to encourage you. Maybe there's somebody who's saying, God, 
there seems like there is no way out. My life is an absolute dead end. And God reminds you this morning, even in that dead end, I am able to make a way for you. So you have the promotion of Mordecai. You have the petition of Esther. And then you have the proclamation to the household of the Jews. What kind of a proclamation is it? It's a very interesting proclamation. I put down three words in my notes. One is, it's a proclamation saying you can defend yourself. Now, I find that beautiful. You know, Haman made sure that the Jews were going to be slaughtered and that the Jews could not defend themselves. On this particular day, the enemies of the Jews were going to plunder them. They were going to kill them. They were going to rape them. They were going to steal from them. They were going to violate them. And what were the Jews going to do? They were going to be helpless, powerless, defenseless, and just go through that great struggle. But now what does God do? God in his mercy and wisdom allows Esther, allows Mordecai, he gives them godly wisdom. So now the edict that goes out from Xerxes says, hey, you know something, when, the, when there are people who rise up to attack you, you can defend yourself. You know, every time I read the book of Esther, one of the things that disturbs me is that almost 75,000 people were killed on that day. There was great bloodshed in the kingdom of Xerxes because of the Jewish people and the Jewish people celebrated their victory over evil. But every time I've read and reread this particular passage of scripture, I realized that there did not need to be that bloodshed. You know, as soon as the edict of Xerxes went out, the enemies of the Jews could have said, you know something, we have been defeated fair and square. We had planned with Haman. We were going to completely kill the people, the people of the Jews in our kingdom. But Yahweh God has moved in powerful ways. What has happened is that the irreversible has been reversed. This is something that only God can do. Let us just quietly accept defeat and move away. If that had happened, you would have had not so many people killed. If that had happened, if all of these people who were against the Jews decided not to fight, there would be nobody killed because the Jews are not going to go on the offensive. The Jews are not going to go to the homes of those that were against them and kill them. The Jews were only given permission to defend themselves. So please keep in mind that though there is great bloodshed in the book of Esther, it is the bloodshed of self-defense. It is not the bloodshed of attacking and killing people. So number one, you have this, uh, this proclamation. It's a proclamation saying you can defend yourself. Number two, it's a proclamation that brought great delight to the household of the Jews. The Bible says, let me read for you. When Mordecai, verse 15, when Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And then note what the Bible says, and the city of Susa held a joy joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy and gladness and honor. In every province, in every city where the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebration. So you see, the proclamation that goes out from Esther and Mordecai is a proclamation saying you can defend yourself. And it's a proclamation that brought great delight to the household of the Jews. The Jewish people had spent many a sleepless night. The Jewish people did not know what to do. The Jewish people were possibly planning an exodus to run away from this place. The Jewish people were at a dead end. But you know what God does? He reverses the irreversible. So as you're looking at chapter, chapter 8, it's the reversing chapter. The promotion of Mordecai the petition of Esther and the proclamation, you can defend yourself, a proclamation that brought great delight. And thirdly, it was a proclamation that put a desire in the hearts of the nations. Chapter 8 ends with these words and many people of other nationalities, what did they do? They became Jews. Why did they became Jew, become Jews? Because the fear of the Jews sees their hearts. The fear of Yahweh God sees their heart. This is not something that man can do. This is something only Yahweh can do. And when the people of the nation saw 
what he had done. They turned to him and they desired to follow him. So chapter 7 is the reckoning chapter. Chapter 8 is the reversing chapter. Chapter 9 is the rescuing chapter. As you read from verses 1 down to verse 16, you find that God rescues his people. And I want to say three things this morning. Number one, I want us to realize that when it came to rescuing his people, more than the Jews fighting, the fear of the Lord fell upon the people. If you're looking at verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict um, commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities and all the provinces of King Xerxes um, uh, to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because people of all other nationalities were afraid of them. Note what the Bible says, everybody was afraid of them. And how, why were they afraid of them? The Jews were a minority in the land of Persia. The Jews were a minority. But why were people afraid of the Jews? They were afraid of the Jews because they now knew that Yahweh was fighting their battles. All the fear of the Lord gripped the hearts of people. The second thing that I want to say is that you also see favor in Mordecai's life. The Bible says in verse 3, And all the nobles of the province, the satraps, the governors, the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized their heart. Oh, you know, these were the people who joined with Haman and they were against Mordecai. But now when God turned the tables, in fact, that's what the Bible says, God turned the tables. When the tables are turned, these very people now are in so many ways respectful of Mordecai because they're talking to one another and they're saying, you know something, this was a man of actual integrity. This was a man of truth. And Yahweh God has shown us that as you stay in faithfulness, he honors you and he lifts you up in due season. So you have the fear of the Lord coming upon the people. You have a very clear demonstration of the favor that Mordecai enjoyed. And then as you read from verses 5 down to 17, you have the fall of the enemy. Oh, there was a great slaughter. Go back and read those details. And like I said to you, about 75,000 people fell to the sword that day. And every time I read about the deaths of people and the killing of people, I feel grieved in my heart. Why should these people have been killed? But please keep in mind that the Jews were simply defending themselves. If the Jews were not able to defend themselves on that day, the Jews in the kingdom of Persia would have been wiped out. Now that was Haman's desire. He wanted to completely wipe out the Jews. But you see what God God did. He turned the tables around and now the Jews, they were not going to go on the offensive. They were coming together and they were going to defend themselves. Anybody who came against them, they were going to defend themselves. And as they defended themselves, 75,000 people fell dead. And I think in many ways, as we think about wars, nations and wars, one of the things that I realize is that there is a great importance for us to be a people who are able to defend ourselves, to be able to defend our sovereign country, to be able to defend ourselves from the attack of the evil one. And as you read the book of Esther, you see a God rescuing his people. All oh, the fear of the Lord falls upon the people. All oh, the favor of Mordecai is visible. And then you have the fall of the enemies of the Jews. And I find it really intriguing, sad, disappointing that there were still about 75,000 people, even though the tables were turned, even though they knew that the battle had been lost, they still said, we are going to go out and stand up against Yahweh God. And sadly, as they stood up against Yahweh God, they were annihilated, they were killed, and they were destroyed. And you know, the Bible reminds us that you and I can never stand against the purposes of God. And even this morning, I think that's such an encouragement, isn't it? Sometimes in the fast changing pace of our world, as all across the globe, there is uncertainty. There are struggles all around the world. Some of us are saying, Lord Jesus, come back 
quickly in the midst of all of that to be reminded that God is still sovereign. He is still on the throne and he is in control of the affairs of men. Oh, a season of reckoning, chapter 7, a season of reversing, chapter 8, a season of rescuing, chapter 9, verses 1 to 16, a season of rejoicing, chapter 9, verses 17 to 32. Like I said, go back and read that section. As I read that section, I put down three words in my notes. Number one is the word recording. You know what is interesting is that the household of the Jews, Mordecai, they recorded record all of these events. That's so important, recording what the Lord has done. You know, one of our favorite um, uh, uncles is an uncle by the name of Jay Walsh. Um, he went out to serve the Lord in Bangladesh, was there for several years. One of the things that Uncle Jay did is that he had journals, journals for every single day of his life. Can you imagine from the time he was a teenager, he had a journal every single day and religiously every single day without missing a single day, he wrote about all that God had done for him. And now in his retirement, before he went home to be with the Lord, he was able to read all that God had done and he wrote several books as he remembered the good things that God had done. So number one is recording. Mordecai and the household of the Jews record the acts of God. And I want to encourage you, you know, we're coming to the end of the year, we're going to begin a new year. Maybe it's a time for you to pick up a journal and start to write down everything that God has done because you can share it with your family, you can share it with your friends, you can share it with your children, you can share it with your grandchildren. So number one, there is recording. Number two, why were they recording? So that they will be remembering, you know, so that through the generations, people will remember how Haman plotted against the household of the Jews, how they cast the pearl, how they cast the lot. And when they cast the lot, it was totally loaded against the Jewish people. They were going to be destroyed. But you know what God does? He turns the poor into the Purim. That's what God is able to do. So number one, there is a lesson of recording. Number two, there is a lesson on remembering. And number three is the lesson of renewing. As you remember what God has done, may you renew your commitment to Yahweh God. May you be renewed in your love for Yahweh God. May you be renewed in your recognition of who Yahweh God is. Is. So as you look at chapter 9 verses 17 to 32, oh, you have the rejoicing of the people of God. Chapter 7, the reckoning of Haman. Chapter 8, the reversing of the irreversible. Chapter 9, the rescuing of the defenseless. Chapter 9, the rejoicing of those who are broken. God has turned their mourning into dancing for them. God has turned their brokenness into into joy. God has turned um, their, 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 their pain into gladness and we want to rejoice along with God and his people. Isn't that amazing what God has done for the household of his people? And then we come down to chapter 10. And as we come down to chapter 10, this is the recognizing chapter. As I read chapter 10, I just put down two words in my notes. One is the elevation or the elevation of Mordecai. As you read verses 1, 2 and 3, the first part, the Bible talks about how Mordecai was elevated by God. Mordecai was now second in rank to Xerxes. Look with me at verse 3. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jewish people or the elevation of Mordecai. And in some ways, the book of Esther finishes by presenting to us the example of Mordecai. The Bible says, why did all this happen? Why did God elevate Mordecai? Because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of the Jews. And I think we need to mark that. Here was a man who worked for the good of his people and he spoke up when he had to speak up. You see, as you look at the end of the book of Esther, you see God presenting to us the example of a faithful man. He faithfully worked for his people. He was truthful in what he did and he spoke up when he needed to speak up. 
What an amazing book, the book of Esther. And what important lessons we learned this morning, these five lessons. Number one is a lesson on reckoning. Number two is a lesson on reversing. He's able to reverse the irreversible. Number three is a lesson on rescuing. He rescues the defenseless. Number four is a lesson on rejoicing. He has turned my mourning into dancing for me. And number five is the lesson of recognizing a faithful man. His integrity, his honesty is honored by God. As we close this particular meditation this morning, what do I take away with me? I want you to stop. Some of you are wondering what happened there. You know? Some of you are wondering, hey, is Ashok all right? Stop. And then there was a silence. I want you to think of the word stop as we leave the service and walk through this week. What does stop help me to remember? Remember, the word stop helps me to remember four really important lessons from the book of Esther. Number one, stop. God is sovereign. Sovereign. Number two, stop. God's timing is perfect. His timing is perfect. Number three, stop. God opposes the proud. And number four, stop. God's purposes always prevail. Let me leave you with that this morning. Stop. He is sovereign. Stop. His timing is perfect. Stop. He opposes the proud. Stop. His purposes, his plans will always prevail. Stories told of William Booth um, as he started the Salvation Army to help people. Oh, they were fellow Christians who were against him. They were government officials that were against him. People misunderstood. And every single day, they were paper articles. They were news reporters that were writing against him. And every single day, his son Bramwell will come with those newspaper reports to his father and say, Daddy, the whole world is against us. Now, in in that context, these were the words of the great William Booth. He says, Bramwell, Bramwell, 50 years hence, it will matter very little indeed how these people treated us. 50 years hence, it will matter very little how these people treated us. It will matter a great deal how we treated the work of God. 50 years from now, nobody will talk about the way in which the world treated us. But 50 years from now, people will talk about the way in which we treated the work of God. And this morning, I think there is such a sobering and yet such a powerful reminder to each one of us as we go into this day saying, God, the rest of the days of my life, I just want to live it to bring your name, honor and praise. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. As every eye is closed and every head is bowed, I want you to think this morning. Think of the many lessons we've learned this morning. This is time of reckoning. What you sow, you will reap. This is time of reversing. God is able to reverse the irreversible. This is time of rescuing. He rescues those that are defenseless. This is time of rejoicing. He turns my mourning into dancing for me. This is time of recognizing God recognizes my faithfulness. Stop. He is sovereign. His timing is always perfect. He opposes the proud. His purposes and his plans prevail. Father, this morning, what more can we ask for, O oh God? You remind us in this season of Christmas that you are sovereign. You remind us that your timing is absolutely perfect. You remind us, O oh God, that you oppose the proud. And you remind us, O oh God, that your plans and your purposes will prevail. And so this morning, Lord, we come to you thanking you that you remind us that you are able to reverse the irreversible. You are able to defend the defenseless. You are God who is able to do the impossible. And so we surrender our all to you, asking that you would lead us in paths of righteousness, be honored and glorified in our lives and through our lives. For we ask with a grateful heart, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now we pray that the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Rest and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen.